Welcome to CSC 6580, Advanced Reverse Engineering. Over here we see some code. Actually, this is a diff of two different versions of code in a repository. The old stuff, which is in pink, and then the stuff that replaced it, which is in green. This is an example of a use after free vulnerability, and it occurs in the ALSA driver on Linux. That's the advanced Linux sound architecture, I believe. And of course, because it deals with something as important as sound, it's deeply embedded in the kernel and can allow an attacker to gain privileges uh, up to and including what we would call ring zero, basically the same privileges as the operating system. And this is from this year. Uh, it's been patched thankfully. Uh, well, and by patched, I mean people who have actively patched it are now patched. Uh, there are probably plenty of systems out there that haven't patched yet. So a question for you is how would you find this? Aren't you concerned about vulnerabilities in your software? How would you find it? Would testing find this? Well, probably not. You have to run exactly the right kind of test under exactly the right conditions to trigger this particular vulnerability. Could you find it by path coverage? Possibly, right? Again, if you run the right test, and path coverage, of course, is where we, uh, we cover each of the different branches uh, associated with nip than else or a while loop. Anywhere there's branching logic, we make sure that we travel down each one of the branches. Condition coverage. Just a, another fancy name for a different kind of coverage. Could you find it with program instrumentation? We'll, we'll do some program instrumentation later in the semester. If we have time, we're going to try to squeeze it in. Uh, and possibly, possibly this could allow you to detect that something is going on. There are tools that instrument your code to look for these kinds of problems, like electric fence and others. Could you find it with static analysis? So what is static analysis? Um, for right now, you can think of it as staring at the program really, really hard. Uh, and you might. This is the kind of thing you might find that way, or you might not. But if you don't find the vulnerability, don't worry. There is someone who will find it for you, and that person may or may not be willing to inform you about the vulnerability. So let's talk about reverse engineering. So reverse engineering is a process of asking questions about software and then answering those questions. That's, that's my story and I'm, I'm going to stick to it. The target for reverse engineering could be source code, it could be assembly code, it could be machine code, right? It's whatever the program is, whatever form it comes to us in, and whatever other intermediate forms we may transform it into. And we ask questions about it. And those questions might be things like, does it have vulnerabilities, right? Is this going to cost us money when we release it? And the process of then answering those questions about this already existing artifact is reverse engineering. And it's a process. And there's different ways to approach it. And as a human-centric process, it often depends on heroics. It's seldom straightforward, and it's not easily repeatable. This is something that's difficult to train people to do, and is frankly difficult to do. And it's a, it's a skill set that can decay quickly. So you can be really good at this stuff and then go away and do something else for six months or a year and come back to it and discover that you really need to, to retrain yourself to do it. But our job is, is to write computer programs that will do this for us. Much harder challenge in many ways. So there are three kinds of analysis we'll talk about. Static analysis is understanding what a program does without running it. Dynamic analysis is understanding what a program did when we ran it. And bulk analysis is 
trying to understand how lots of programs relate to each other. And context is dependent in every one of these cases. In static analysis, we need to have a good model in our head about how the system works. In dynamic analysis, we need to have really good experimental control so we understand what happened when a program ran. And with bulk analysis, we really need to understand what it is we're measuring and, and how these programs relate to each other. So we'll talk about source code, assembly code, machine code, and we'll talk about some intermediate languages throughout this class. So high level languages are made to allow you, the programmer, to efficiently describe an algorithm. And they come with all kinds of stuff. They come with while loops and if then else's and folds. Uh, and they provide data structures sometimes. Right? You have a standard library that typically goes with, with uh, your programming environment. And it provides things like red black trees uh, and uh, link lists and skip lists and those kinds of things. Uh, and that's all great. That allows you to very efficiently describe an algorithm to the computer. Assembly language is meant to be understandable by a human. Now, you will think I'm crazy when I say this, but that's what it's really for. It's an intermediate, uh, at least it is now, an intermediate between high-level languages and the very low-level machine code, which no one wants to try to read. But the fact that it has mnemonics, the fact that it has a syntax to it, all that exists for you, the user. The computer doesn't care. It's going to parse it and do what it wants to do with it. But it's really there to be understandable by a human. Machine code is created to be understandable by the machine. And it's there to initiate a physical operation some computation that will happen on the machine, right? So up at the top, I said algorithm. We're going to describe an algorithm. And down at the bottom, I said some physical thing that happens, right? Because up at the top, we're describing, you know, we're going to run a loop while the following condition is true. Down at the bottom, we have to describe that in terms of electrical fields. Uh, we can describe it in terms of, of some abstract concepts like registers, but it's very, very low level. So what is reverse engineering good for? Well, we can use it for vulnerability discovery, as we've already talked about. Malware analysis. We can use it for optimization of your programs. And sometimes people misplace or lose their source code, and you can use it for code recovery. Let's go back to static and dynamic analysis. So here's a program in C. Hopefully it doesn't look too weird to you. Uh, you can ignore the first line. We'll come back and talk about that in a future class. Uh, but the rest of it should look very straightforward to you. We include standard I.O. We include int types, which you should be using. If you're using int, except in cases where you have to because of the interface. Uh, for example, int main here. Uh, then you're doing it wrong. You shouldn't be using int. You should be using types that, that are explicit about the number of bits. And we're going to do that here. And those are made available in int types. Uh, it's There's your main. Your main has three arguments. You may not recognize the last one, but it's there. Uh, it's not part of the C standard, but it's part of standard C, if that makes some sense. Uh, everybody basically includes it. Uh, it is a pointer to the environment variables uh, that are present. And I'm going to include it here because it's worth knowing about because it will show up when we talk about the C interface. So then we have a 32-bit counter and a 32-bit number. We uh, use scanf to read a number from the prompt. That percent and preu32 says go and read an unsigned 32-bit number at the prompt, we're going to put it in numbers. We pass a pointer to number and we check the return value. And if the return value is less than zero, 
some kind of an error, we assume, you return minus one from the whole program and terminate. Otherwise, while that number is greater than one, we do some stuff. And if you, some of you may recognize this, this computes a series uh, called the hailstone numbers. So if a number is even, we multiply it, uh, sorry, if the number is even, we divide it by two, excuse me. If a number is odd, we multiply it by three and add one. And each time we do this, we count once. Uh, and then at the end, we print out the count and we return with zero to indicate no errors. Pretty straightforward program. Don't get hung up on the hailstone numbers. We just do a computation and, and there you go. So the question is, what does this program print out for the input 19? And how would you find out? Well, you could stare at it and, and maybe you work your way through it and execute it in your head and get an answer. And that might be just fine. Uh, but it might take you a while and it might be hard. Uh, another way, you know, and, and, and also suppose the number wasn't 19, but it was 1019. Would you feel comfortable just working it through in your head then? Maybe, maybe you might be concerned that it would take a long time. So how could you find out? Well, the obvious way is to run it and put in 19. And if you do that, the output will be 20. So that means that little that little loop in there, the body of the loop, runs 20 times because you can see count starts out at zero. Each time the, the body of the loop executes, we add one to it. And if the result is 20, we must have run that loop 20 times. And so for 19, it prints out 20. We did some dynamic analysis, right? We ran the program and observed what it did. Uh, there you go. Let's ask a different question. For what inputs, if any, does this program output zero? Hmm, we could do the same thing. We could compile it and run it and then try typing in different things and seeing if we get zero. But, you know, we wanna get them all. And maybe we'll see a pattern or maybe we won't. So what's a, what's a reliable way to figure that out? Well, here I don't think dynamic analysis is what we want. Here I think what we want is to examine the code and try to figure that out, right? Read through the program and see if we can figure out what's happening. So count is output at the end and we would like it to be zero when it's output. It's set to zero initially. And it's only ever incremented when the loop runs. Aha. So if it's set to zero at the top, it's incremented when the loop runs, it only goes up and it's printed at the bottom. It'll be zero when the loop never runs. So there we go. We want to be sure it's not incremented. And that happens when the loop doesn't execute. And that happens when the loop predicate is false. So we want to have number be less than or equal to one. And number is an unsigned 32-bit integer and the only values less than or equal to one are zero and one. And so there we go. Uh, it outputs zero when the input is either zero or one. So that's great. We figured it out by examining the code. We can call that static analysis. We didn't run it. We just examined it and thought through what it did using our mental model of how the program worked. And that was great. So for dynamic analysis, we know with certainty what the code did for a specific input 
a specific environment and for that particular run. That may seem a bit pedantic, but think about it. Suppose we ran it again, and we ran it on a different platform with a different compiler, and something was a little bit different. Or let's say we run it and the machine is running out of memory. Different things can happen as a result of that. This is an approach that works well for code that's safe to execute. It's not malware that's going to damage our machine. That runs in reasonable time. If I had to wait a year to get the answer, this would not be a good way to do it. And for which we want a, quote, what can happen type of answer. Right? I don't want. I don't tell you about everything that can happen. I want to tell you about a specific thing that might occur. And it's pretty simple. Uh, it does require that we have proper experimental controls. Right? We set the machine up in a certain way. We have a certain amount of memory, certain OS, certain compiler, uh, certain runtime. All those things are sort of controlled for. Then I can say with fairly high certainty. This will happen the next time those circumstances recur. For static analysis, we know with certainty what the code does given our assumptions about it. And it works for code that is not safe to execute, right, like malware, that might not run in a reasonable time, and for which we want an ever or any kind of answer. It can be really hard to do that, uh, which was easier, compiling and running and typing in 19 and looking at the answer or thinking through how count gets set or how number gets set. That's harder. Uh, well, that's most of what we're going to do in the class. Most of what we're going to do in the class is static analysis. And doing this requires a model of computation. Think of dynamic analysis as an experiment, just like a lab experiment from chemistry. Think of static analysis as building a model. Both require some discipline, so the results are useful, and neither is the program itself. They are, you know, dynamic analysis is a set of, set of observations. Static analysis is a set of models. All models are wrong, but some are useful. The program does whatever the program does. And we just have to accept that. So let's go back and think about full range of behavior. And, and remember our program and our answer to it. And we said the output is zero when the input is an unsigned integer that is less than or equal to one. That is the input is either zero or one. And there's a lot of words in that box. It doesn't just say zero one. It says an unsigned integer and, and so on. <clears throat> do, we, do we need all that? What if the input's not an unsigned integer? Well, this sounds like a good use for dynamic analysis. Let's try it. So we run it and we put in negative 12. And we get the answer 224. What? What does that even mean? I mean, negative 12 is certainly not greater than 1. And so, assuming it read it, it shouldn't run. And, I mean, it's an unsigned integer anyway, so what the heck's happening? So we run it a second time, and instead of entering an integer, signed or unsigned, we just enter the name Fred, and we get 156. How did that even work? I mean, look at the scanf line. The scanf line runs, and we check the return value, as we said earlier, and we make sure that it's if it's less than 0, we return negative 1. None of those values is negative 1. What happened? So how would you figure this out? Well, we're going to do the thing that programmers always do. We're going to add print statements to it to figure it out. Let's add a print statement. So we do a printf right after it to show us 
what the program thinks the number we entered is. And for minus 12, it thinks it's 4,294,967,284. Just not negative 12. It's not even, I don't even know how that gets that. Okay, and then the answer for that is 224. Sure, I guess that's fine. For Fred, <laughs> it says it's 472,243,168, which is, I guess, Fred? But something weird happened. For negative 12, we got 224. For Fred, we got 96. Let's go back to the slide. 224 remained the same, but for Fred, before we got 156, and now we get 96. So that's not even the same number as we had before. That's crazy. Why is that happening? So it's clear that something isn't right with our scanf check. And so we read the documentation for scanf finally, and we discover that it reports an error on end of file. So let's run it and let's try pressing Control D, or if you're on Windows, Control Z, and just see what happens. And when we run it and we immediately exit, uh, it exits with exit value negative one, which in the 8-bit world is 225. Now, you don't always see the exit or return value of a program. The way to check it is to echo dollar sign question mark on Linux, and that will display the exit value of the most recent process that terminated. We are talking to the shell. The shell is always running. It's reading lines, interpreting them, and giving you the result. So the last process that the shell started, then terminated, was this was our hail to program, and so echo dollar question mark shows the return value from that process. There's no return value from echo dollar question mark because it was not a process. It was just running inside the shell. All right. Otherwise, if it's not got to immediately get a, a, a uh, end of file. It reports the number of arguments read. And in our case, it should be one. If it returns zero, the number is unchanged. Number is unchanged. Number is unchanged. But it's also uninitialized. <gasps> we never initialized number up there. We initialized count to zero, but we didn't initialize number because we're immediately going to read it. In Rust, for example, if you initialize number, it would complain that the value you initialized it to is never read. But here in this C world, it turns out it gets, uh, it's, it's getting read. So let's think about what's going on here. Let's think about a model for what's happening. We have our program and we have inputs that we know about and outputs that we see. But we may also have inputs we don't know about and outputs we don't see. Uh, an example of an input we don't know about is uh, the uh, current state of memory of the machine. Is it running out of memory? Uh, there might be, we might be using a temp file, but something comes along and deletes that temp file. And that's changing an input to our program in a way that we don't really see or account for. Outputs we don't see could be things like the return value, unless we explicitly do the work to check it. So when our program runs, we need to establish experimental control. We have to specify the, which inputs are controlled inputs and which are uncontrolled inputs. And we have to understand which outputs are observable and which are unobservable. That's very important. For static analysis, the same kind of model holds true. Inputs we know about and those we don't. Outputs we see and those we don't. And we still have to identify them all, uh, but perhaps we can now reason about other things uh, symbolically. So back to our little program. If we enter something that's not an unsigned integer, then the output ends up unspecified. We have undefined behavior. 
because we never initialized number. Uh, and we can fix the program by correcting the way that it checks the return value. Uh, we could, for example, go in and change that less than zero to be less than one. Right? We want to get one answer back. Uh, that's a uh, it's an unsigned 32-bit integer. But this brings up another question, which is what happens if we enter something that is outside the 32-bit unsigned integer range? What would happen then? Would we still get a result back? Or would we get back a, a 1 or a 0 from scanf? Well, we can try it. And so 32-bit integers live in this closed interval from 0 up to 2 to the 32 minus 1. And there are the values there in that little interval. So what if we enter something that is greater than that last value. So let's take that last value and add one to it so that five becomes a six and let's enter it. And our little program prints out zero. It says, I think the input is zero. And that's interesting, right? So maybe that indicates that when we read something with scanf, it wraps around uh, and, and so if we enter, you know, 2 to the 32, we get back 0. So we get back the result mod 2 to the 32. And that's a reasonable thing. Computers do that often. Seems like a reasonable thing to, to uh, guess. But is it always true? Here's an interesting question. What is the maximum input that scanf can read? And if you read the man page in the documentation, you'll find out it's unspecified. So what is scanf doing? Well, 64-bit integers have values in that closed interval. That's 0 up to 2 to the 64 minus 1. So what if we enter something greater than that? And so, I don't know, let's enter that maximum value. And what we get back is the maximum 32-bit value. Well, that's interesting. So maybe it does wrap around. Maybe that's, maybe that is correct. Let's try some other experiments. So I enter one less than the maximum and then enter one more than the maximum. And the one less than the maximum, they give me one less than the 32-bit maximum. But the one more than the, than the 64-bit maximum gives me back the 32-bit maximum. So it seems like scanf parses up to a 64-bit integer and then just performs modular arithmetic to give us back a 32-bit integer that we want. A reasonable assumption. Based on what we know now, we're running scanf and treating it like a black box. We could open it up and look at the source code for it because, of course, it's part of Linux. Linux is open source. And the standard C library, which this is part of, is open source. But without doing that, we're left making reasonable assumptions based on what we observe from our experiments. All right, I hope all that made sense to you. To figure out what's going on, we used a combination of static analysis reading the code, and dynamic analysis. We read the program, and then for understanding the interaction with scanf, we ran some tests. And we used values around the known limits. And this is exactly the kind of analysis that you will do if you're given a program to analyze. And you want to think about how you might automate this sort of analysis. So vulnerabilities often occur at the edges where two systems connect to one another or where some limit can be approached or exceeded. For example, our program might have a vulnerability in that I can enter these values that aren't numbers or I can enter values that are out of a certain range. The program accepts them and then it tries to process, tries to do its work using those and perhaps bad things can happen. So there you go.
Let's change gears slightly and let's talk a little bit about ethics. So as a graduate student in computer science, you're going to learn some very powerful tools. Uh, in this class, you're going to learn some stuff that can that you can use to uh, pull apart programs and see how they work and put them back together in different ways. People use the te these techniques to, to cheat at video games, to build malware, all the kinds of things that you that you might do. Sometimes that's fine. Sometimes that's not so fine. And the thing to realize is that the world around you is a software determined world, increasingly so. Who gets a car loan? Uh, you know, what is your bail going to be uh, in the courts? What will your sentence be? These things are often set by algorithms, right? I look up something on the internet and an algorithm may tell me an answer and I may choose to believe that uh, because I, I trust it. And the algorithms control not just the things we talked about, but they control the power grid, they control the steering and braking in your car, they control, you know, they can control uh, robotic surgery systems like the Da Vinci surgical robot. They can do considerable harm. And, you know, the stuff that you work on can help some people and can hurt other people. And you need to be conscious and aware of that. Okay, so there's two things to think about here. One is ethics. Ethics tells me what's right and what's wrong. Okay. Does it tell me that I have to do what's right and that I can't do what's wrong? It's just a way for me to understand these two, to come up with a set of standards for understanding that. Public policy is the institutionalized elements that we often associate with ethics, laws, regulations, guidelines, those kinds of things. Public policy can be informed by ethics. Ideally, it will be. But it concerns a different scope of action than what's typically covered by ethical systems. And it doesn't have to be, right? Public policy can be, in some cases, arbitrary. Which side of the road you drive on is arbitrary, right? There's not an ethical standard that tells you that driving on the right-hand side of the road is good and driving on the left is bad. Uh, unless you're already in the context that everyone else is doing that, and if you try this opposite way, you may cause harm to yourself or others. Okay, so in computing, you're going to make a lot of decisions, and the decisions that you make should be informed by ethics. They'll be evaluated in the scope of public policy, right? Was what you did legal? Did it, did it conform to existing guidelines? Did it conform to regulations, etc.? And increasingly, there are guidelines and regulations that control uh, what goes on. So is, it, is an action ethical if you just follow the law? Does that get you uh, over this? And I think that probably most of us have either read or seen some performance of Les Miserables, and we probably know that no, that's not the case. Is something, you know, just this, this equal treatment make something just or unjust? And the answer again is not always. Equal treatment under the law can ignore uh, underlying inequality. So you have to think about that as well. This is not a class on ethics. I don't want to go too deeply into all of this, but I want you to think about this because, again, you're going to come out of your come out with your degree and the ability to to 
to write software under which some people will benefit and some other people may be harmed. And that benefit and harm may not always be apparent, uh, but it will probably always be there. And it's something that you should be concerned about and should be conscious of. All right, some things to consider. You should acknowledge that your actions can make some people's lives better and may make other people's lives worse. All right, enough of that. Let's talk about the class. So I'm Stacy Prowell. I am a researcher at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, I am also a professor here in the computer science department where I am the Associate Director of Research for CERAC, the Cybersecurity Center. My office is over in Prescott in 409. I, I'm typically only here on Tuesdays and Thursdays because I live in Knoxville and I work in Oak Ridge. And my uh, quote-unquote day job is at the National Lab. As a result, I can be hard to get to. There's my email. There's my cell number you should feel free to call or text me, okay? Email me, certainly, email me. But if it's, a, if it's critical and I'm not getting back to you, hit me up with a text or a call. If I don't want to answer the phone right then, I won't. I'm very good at ignoring things. Uh, so don't feel bad about texting me or calling me, it's fine. Email me if you need an immediate answer call or text me and I'll try to get something back to you sooner. Um, I intend this class to be available through Zoom. Uh, we'll have to see if we need to do that. Uh, if we do, they're the Zoom coordinates that I've set up. Practical Binary Analysis is a good book. Uh, I like it. That said, I don't know how well, at one point I considered using it for, as a textbook for the class. Uh, it's pretty light on assembly, which we're gonna spend a lot of time on here. Uh, but uh, it covers some really good stuff. We'll have to see. Uh, we're gonna cover some papers in the second half of the class. You don't need the book. We're gonna cover everything you need. Uh, but if you want something to supplement it with, that may be a good thing to supplement. My goal is for slides to be available just before the class starts. I've got tons of slides, but I'm always tinkering with them up till the very end. Uh, just because, you know, I, I'm thinking, oh, I should do it this way. Or I should explain it this way. Uh, and then uh, I go in and make changes. So I'll try to make them available right before the class starts. Classes will be recorded, I hope, and made available, I hope. Through iLearn, sometimes that can take a few days, sometimes it can take a week, so don't rely on that. Homework is given out weekly on Thursday and is due the following Thursday. And we'll discuss the current homework at the start of class and the new homework is given at the end of class. So homework is due at the start of class and given out at the end of class and you have a week. There'll be two exams, a midterm and a final. And the exams count each 20% of your final grade Homework counts 60 for a grand total of 100. Homework is graded. You get, a, you get a point for being right and you get a point for being on time. So there you go. You can get up, you can get zero to two points. Half your points come from just turning it in. So turn it in. If you turn it in early, I can take a look at it, maybe give you some feedback, and you're welcome to turn it in again. You can turn it in as many times as you want. Uh, up until the moment it's due and you can turn it in after that too you just will lose the on time credit uh, I'll accept homework up till the very last day of class uh, exam grading exams are graded out of a hundred the way my exams typically work is uh, I'll give you a big set of questions and like maybe let's say 15 and they're equally weighted and all the parts are equally weighted. And you can answer as many or as few as you want. And I'll grade all your answers. And then I'll take the best 10 answers and compute your grade from that. 
don't know if it'll be exactly this. In the past, it's been like 15 and best eight or whatever. Um, I work all the... <laughs> I work all the problems myself, I time myself, I multiply it by a number, and then I, I, uh, I choose based on that. So the idea will be you'll have a, you know, a lot of questions to choose from uh, and you should work through them. I'm told I give fairly hard exams. Sorry, that's just the way I am. Uh, but students tend to do fairly well, so that's, that's good. Both exams are take home. You'll have about a week. I say about a week. You'll have a week for the midterm, and you'll have roughly a week for the final. Uh, I think there's a little uh, uh, shift there because the final goes out last day of class, and it's due at our regular exam time. And I can't remember exactly how many that is, but it's 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 like a, a week ish. The material is cumulative, so the exams are two, and the exams focus on principles. So, if you have a disability that will impact your ability to learn in this class, or that you think might, or you discover later on in the class is impacting it. Come and let me know, and we'll figure something out. And if you don't want to declare a disability to the university and get it documented, but you'd like me to know about it, please come and talk to me, and we'll figure out something to do. Right? Either way, uh, we'll try to figure out a way uh, that you can can learn and and get through the class. So always come talk to me. Trust your intellect. Trust yourself to do this stuff. Some of this stuff is very hard. Uh, if you're struggling, struggling with it, talk to me. Okay. I want you to to take responsibility for your own work. I want you to give responsibility for others' work, and I want you to share responsibility for collaborative work because that's the honest thing to do, right? We want to treat each other ethically and want to give them the same kind of considerations we'd want. So please, if you are in dire straits, uh, talk to me and we'll try to figure something out. Uh, you're at a university with a bunch of people who are going through what you're going through or have been through what you're going through before. And we're all here to help you. We're all here uh, for you to have a good learning experience. So don't do something you may regret because uh, I am not tolerant about this stuff. Uh, but come talk to me. I'm happy to help. Um, enough said about that. Expectations. So I have expectations of you, which is that you will come to class. When there's reading material, you'll read it, that you'll do the homework, that you'll email me, and that you'll text me if I don't respond to your email. Okay? That's my expectations. I expect you to know a reasonable amount of C. Maybe some C++. We may have some come up in class. Uh, sometimes we do. Uh, I expect you to understand how to interact with Linux. I expect you to know some basic discrete math. Okay, so the thing at the bottom should not look, should look a little like Greek, but not too much like it. For all X and Y, they're in the domain of F. The ordered pair of X and Y is in the kernel, if and only if F of X is F of Y. All right. Here's some C. The C should not look insane to you. Uh, the one thing you might not necessarily clearly recognize is down there in the body of the main function and it's an array of function pointers. You might want to look up how function pointers uh, work. That's about as complex as anything we're dealing with over again. It's a 6,000 level computer science course so I expect you to know how to read and write code. I expect you to know what binary is, what hexadecimal is. If you not super familiar with hex, go back and read about it because we're going to use hexadecimal a ton in this class. And I'm going to expect you to be able to convert from hexadecimal to binary and back pretty quickly. Uh, decimal, harder, but you should understand how to get from hexadecimal to binary. 
what are you going to learn? You're going to learn assembly language. It's going to spend about half the class learning assembly language. You're going to learn some computer architecture, Python. If you don't know Python, this is going to be a good time for you to learn it. Lots of Linux command line tools. Maybe additional discrete math you hadn't learned before because we're going to study some type theory. Uh, there you go. I expect you to run experiments, try things, test things out, and play with stuff. I'm going to give you tools. You should play with them. You should see what happens. And if you can get the answer to a question by running something, writing some code and running that code, you should do that, right? You should do that. If you can solve a computer science problem with a computer, that sounds like a win to me. Learning goals. So you'll learn to understand assembly language and executable files, how the operating system loads and execute files, how to use command line utilities to get information, how to figure out the true control flow, identify pointers, guess data types, instrument programs. Possibly, if there's time, we'll do taint analysis. I'm hopeful that there will be time to do some symbolic execution and how to automate all of this. So I, I think I may have already used the term binary program once or twice. What the heck is that? A binary program is a program in its native executable form. And it's not necessarily the same as a compiled program. Uh, a binary might never have been through a compiler. It could be that it was hand assembled or even that it was, it was you know, built in some other perverse way. And it's not quite the same as executable program because scripts and those things can be executable. Uh, the programs we'll look at will typically rely on the operating system infrastructure, right? The, an example of a program that doesn't rely on the operating system infrastructure is the operating system startup code. But, but not, that's, a, that's a very unusual corner case. We, won't, we'll, we might talk about it a little bit, but, uh, but for the most part, we'll deal with stuff that, that relies on the OS, runs under an OS. So when we're done, you'll know how to write programs that analyze other programs. That's it. And so I will talk to you next time.